Waiting, waiting, waiting. It's my, it's loading. It says we're going live, but it's loading. Are we there? It now says we're live. It's being very slow. So I apologize, everyone. If you're hearing this, there we go. We have an ad. Okay, we're live, babe. Okay. We're live, finally. That was really slow on our end. Sorry, everyone. Here we are. Um, let me pull up our Zoom so I can see this in real time. Zoom and chat at the same time. I've been taking notes. Have you been taking notes, babe? Uh, I mean, I listened to it last week, so it's kind of fresh, but a little bit. Yeah. Uh, John and I have been sitting in um, at separate rooms. I'm in our in a bedroom, and he's in a, his office, and we've been listening, and we have not talked before this. So, anyway, let's get down to it. We've got 300 and pe 300 people here watching, and there is a lot to unpack, and I have a lot of questions, but I think. Mm -hmm. Let me just start. Let me just start by uh, saying that this, you know, I got to to see the comments in the chat for the first time. I can't see them now, by the way, but uh, I really appreciated some of the comments. One of my favorite comments was, um, "Where does Jason Mao get his costume?" Which I think is totally relevant with Halloween coming up. So, because I, I want to look into that. So, uh, if any of you guys know where Jason Mao gets his outfit or who does his wardrobe, that would be phenomenal information for Halloween. Um, although I think that, I think the video or the clip that Lauren showed was actually like him making a real movie, so. No, I don't think it was. I, so he, I think he was trying to dress as Moroni, a Mormon oh, prophet, okay. Captain Moroni, because he does this whole thing about being a warrior like Moroni. Oh, it looked like some type, I couldn't tell if it was like Greek or Roman, but it kind of looked like some type like of Roman glad, his, his time frame is way off. It looked like some kind of gladiator outfit, but. Um, That's his take on Moroni. And I think that that was a Jason Mao photo shoot. Okay. So. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, he had uh, a lot of photo shoots to choose from too. I'll just say when I was choosing B-roll. People asked at the beginning of the video, oh, did Chad put this together? I decided to add the visuals because I thought it would help with the understanding. Chad doesn't have the most exciting voice. I wanted it to make more sense to people. I like visuals. I'm a visual person, visual learner. And I thought I set out to do the entire 45 minutes and I think I did like 30 minutes or 35, but I just couldn't. I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't listen to it anymore. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I, I did enjoy finding those Jason Mao photos. I'll just say that. And there were plenty to choose from. Um, you know, I, I thought I knew what I wanted to talk about a little bit. And then I watched that and watched some of the comments and I think I'm in a reverse course just a little bit. Um, so I, I wanna take some questions too, but I, let me just offer a few thoughts up front. Um, you know, with 9-11, with today being 9-11, that's, that's kind of on my mind. And, um, you know, of course we have the bracelets for JJ and we're thinking about the victims and, you know, thinking about the victims of 9-11. And I think that's, that's an important thing to acknowledge today. Um, you know, there's there's always kind of a, a a sadness that hangs over this day. I think, um, and so I, you know, in watching that, I, I started rethinking a little bit about Osama bin Laden and um, maybe some parallels between Osama bin Laden and Chad Daybell. And I, I know that that seems absurd. <laughs> In a way, it seems absurd. But um, we've made some comparisons between terrorists and kind of what this cult is doing. I mean, I think this cult was 
compared to most terrorist cells, this cult was like completely inept. You know, it's quite different in some ways. But, um, but I, you know, when I think about Osama bin Laden and Chad Daybell, you know, uh, there were a lot of people were making comments about the humor. Um, you know, it's it, it's it's not it's more like I don't consider it humor so Ch much as Chad's kind of humor. like Chad's, Chad's humor. Yeah. Chad's humor, right? It's not to me. It's it was more like a nervous laughter. Like it's 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 not real humor, right? Like even Alex Cosp is like a superior comedian compared to Chad. <laughs> so. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about that is that um, there's there's some recent research by um, some German folks that um, um, Morten Moshagen in 2018 and a group of German researchers, they wrote a, a paper called The Dark Core of Personality. It's a brilliant paper. It summarizes um, a lot of research on tyrants and dictators and you know people in the 20th century that have committed genocides like Stalin, Hitler, you know those would be some of the bigger names but Osama bin Laden would fit in that category as well right and um, one of the things they found or, or that's been found in a lot of the literature on people that are that are mass murderers like bin Laden is narcissism um, and that's probably no surprise right like um, they find that, you know, that narcissists, because they lack empathy and they're so self-absorbed, they're more likely to engage in murder or mass murder than the average person. Um, and so um, to me, you know, in, in looking at Chad Daybell, that's always a question, right? Is Chad Daybell a narcissist? I mean, in, in, I don't want to get into diagnosis uh, because that will get me in trouble. Um, I'll say I think he is, because you can't. I'll say that I think he is, and we have some narcissist questions from a, a listener, but go ahead. So I, I think it's fair to say that he has a lot of narcissistic features. Let's say that. So I'm not diagnosing, but um, I think if, if we were to like make a comparison between like Osama bin Laden uh, and Chad Daybell, narcissism would certainly be one of those features. Um, the, the, these researchers, these same researchers also found that Machiavellianism is, is another feature of, of these personalities that tend to kill a lot of people. Um, Machiavellianism is basically being manipulative, being deceptive, lying, do whatever it's, it's doing whatever it takes to get your way, essentially. Like you power becomes everything, everything else is secondary to power. So people will manipulate and lie and deceive, they're callous, they'll do whatever they can to get ahead. That's what Machiavellianism is, is, is in psychology. So um, that's another trait that that bin Laden has. So um Right. So it, a lot of people in the chat said that Chad was really manipulative. Right. So that would be that's another question. Does he fit that category? Right. Like, I mean, to some degree, the answer, I think, would have to be yes, he does. Um, so that, you know, that's another interesting comparison. Another feature of mass murderers is they tend to have some psychopathic traits, meaning, um, you know, again, they they they. And there's a lot of overlap, by the way, between like psychopathy and narcissism and antisocial personality. There's there's many similarities, but um, psychopaths basically have no remorse. They have no emotions. They have no fear. They have no sadness. Um, you know, and I mean, and of course, there's differences, but but by and large, uh, those qualities tend to define psychopaths. So uh, psychologists sometimes sometimes refer to those three things as the dark triad. Um, there's another thing called the dark tetrad, which is a fourth element, which is sadism. So if you add in sadism to that equation, meaning you actually enjoy the suffering of other people, that's a real prescription for problems. So um, I don't know enough about bin Laden to, to comment on that or even psych, you know, psychopathy. I don't know. 
I don't really know his history that well, but certainly like if you look at, if you look at s- someone like Hitler, um, Hitler was very sadistic. Hitler actually derived pleasure and enjoyment from people's deaths at a very large scale, right? So, um, so you know, these I'm not I'm I'm raising more questions than I'm answering, I think. But you know, it it's it's worth I, I bring this up because of 9-11 and Chad Daybell and his flat affect and kind of his fake tears and you know, probably some of his narcissistic features and right, like so um most Hagen refers to this group of traits as what he calls the D factor. It means the it refers to the dark factor. Um they throw in some other stuff too, by the way, like paranoia. Paranoia is a big, is a big um, component of a lot of, of these types of people. Saddam Hussein seems to fit like all of these. He has all of these elements, right? He was sadistic. He was paranoid. He was cruel. He was narcissistic. He was a psychopath. He was, um, you know, he had a lot of Machiavellianism, right? Like, and I don't know if Chad Debo was at that level, but he doesn't have to be at that level to do what he did, right? Like he can he can have some of those features. Um, right. So, and the thing about these features that again, like what these what the authors argue, and and they looked at a lot of different research studies on this. Um, what they argue is that there's overlap between all this stuff. So you know, like some some of our listeners may say, well, you know, I know someone is a narcissist, he's not that harmful, or she isn't, or whatever. Um, and that may be true. But, you know, there's so much overlap between like narcissism and psychopathy and um, Venn diagram. Is how you right. Say. The overlap is intense. Right. And so you'll see, you know, you know, might have someone who's kind of narcissistic, and they might have you know, some of the traits of psychopathy, and they may not qualify for any of those diagnoses, right? But they'll, they'll kind of fit that category. Um, and so I, I think what I would say about Chad Daybell is this, this D factor, or this dark factor that they talk about, which is really kind of redefining the field of, um, of research in this area. It's, it's really some great research. And again, the article is called The Dark Core of Personality, um, I think Chad Daybell has the D factor. Um, you know, to, to what degree, it's not clear. But I mean, you know, is there manipulation going on? Is there some deceit? It, yeah, I mean, all that stuff is there, right? Is, is, is there some sadistic stuff? Uh, I don't know. You know, if he had a part in, in dismembering Tylee's body, yeah, it seems like there could be some sadistic stuff. Is there paranoia? Seems like there's a little bit. Um, so I don't know. I, I think on 9-11 and kind of thinking about that and the D factor, and I wasn't going to really get into this too much, um, but it seems like maybe that's a good place to start, you know, at least to raise the question of um, who is this guy, you know, and does he, does he fit the D factor? Does he, does he show a lot of these personality traits that some of the great mass murderers of this century show, you know, um, I don't, I don't know if he, you know, would fully fit. I mean, he's, he's probably not at the level of Saddam Hussein, but then maybe you could argue maybe if he was a little more charismatic and a little smarter and right, maybe he could be, Uh, you know, it would, it would be a hard sell to me to, to argue that there's, you know, I don't know, 300 million zombies in the United States, but, but maybe, maybe he adapts, maybe he changes zombies to something else. And, um, so, you know, for, for Hitler, zombies were the equivalent of Jewish people, right? For Stalin, they were enemies of the state. Um, for Saddam Hussein, they were anybody who disagreed with him. So, um, I don't know, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question to me, but I think maybe that's the place I would start is, is by thinking about, Chad Daybell and the D factor and kind of these ugly traits of his personality that may not be super obvious. Um, You know, a lot of people say, well, he's humble and he's right. He's, he's unassuming and he's quiet. So what, right? Like, I mean, um, I can read you journalistic accounts of, of reporters that interviewed Hitler that said he was so shy and so 
yes. unassuming, right? Like he wasn't in public, but he was privately. So I wouldn't put a lot of stock in that. Right, no, exactly. Um, I've heard the same thing about Hitler, that he was quiet and shy. Thank you, Mary uh, DC Deals for your donation. Colette asked a great question. And I have a lot of questions I wrote down from the chat and from Patreon. Our Patreon listeners had early access to the interview and have written some excellent questions that I've written down that I wanna ask you. Uh, Colette said the range of emotion in his speech was interesting. He went from crying to that kind of embarrassing laugh, which people almost said it was almost like he couldn't believe the cool kids were buying his books, you know, <laughs> that, that it was right. like he was that he, almost like he couldn't believe that somebody yeah. else that's here on chat saying that. And then Clutch kind of asking about his range of emotion. I'm going to also throw in that I noticed he was really insecure. He mentioned braces. Oh, this is before I got braces. Oh, I've lost some weight here, snow blowing. He kept kind of doing the self de deprecating nervous. Yeah. Um, anyway, go ahead. I threw a lot at you, but <laughs> let us know your thoughts. Uh, you know, the, the emotion, so if, if you're referring to like the parts where he cries, um, you know, it, first of all, I don't see a lot of range of emotion. I think people picked up on that right away. There's, there's a really limited range here. Like he's monotone, his, his affect is really flat. You know, it, there might be some depression here. I don't know. Like he's, in his autobiography, he talks about being lonely as a kid. You know, it wouldn't surprise me to see a little depression. But um, the emotion to me was just really a testament to himself. He was crying over his vision. He was crying over how his vision is so important and it's going to change the world, right? So let's get this. This would take us back to narcissism, right? Like his who cries over their vision of the future? Like he thinks this thing is so real and so true and so good and so important that he's crying over it. I mean, some of it is, I think some of it is selling the audience. You know, if you, like a couple of people pointed out, you know, sometimes at, at Mormon, you know, testimony meetings and you and I have been to those, you know, that people cry because they're invested in their story, right? And they're, they're emotional about it and, um, I think you have some version of that here, that he's like so invested in his visions that he's, he's so attached and he believes it so deeply. And, you know, Lauren and I just debate this all the time about the degree to which he believes it and the degree to which he doesn't. Um, and it's a really, it's an ongoing question. I don't think there's a simple answer to it, but if you listen to this, I think the, a lot of the emotion shows that he's really attached to his beliefs and that he's crying. He's not, cry you know, as people want, he doesn't cry over the fact that there's all these murdered people that if he's left in his trail or his wake, like he doesn't care about that. He just, he cares about the fact that he has this glorious vision that's going to deliver him to the new Jerusalem and that's worth crying over. Right. right. So that, and that, by the way, that takes us right back to narcissism. So if they're of, of the, of the de-factor traits, narcissism is number one. And, and just as a, and a quick aside, by the way, like anybody who reads Greek tragedy or great literature, Shakespeare, like hubris is this, it, you know, people get into trouble in every tragedy because of hubris, right? And it's the same thing. That's, that's what we're seeing with Chad Daybell. They're, you know, he's, he's the, the guy that's going to lead the new Jerusalem and um, just, I mean, just think about how arrogant it is, right? To, how arrogant is it to have these visions and then to argue that those visions are true? They're going to come true. Of all the people on this planet, of the 7 trillion people, you're the one person who has the visions of the truth that are going to be delivered. You know, I guess they're delayed because of Trump, but they'll be delivered, um, you know, I don't know, soon, like in the next few years, it sounds like. So, um, so. You know, mention I, really quickly. Oh, go, no, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, so I, I, I think that that goes back to the narcissism, right? Like it's just, it's, it's, he lives in a fantasy world. He creates this fantasy world and he lives in it and he sells it and he sells it in his books and he lectures about it. And I mean, that's the most interesting thing to me, right? Could you imagine living your life in this complete fictional universe 
and how divorced you would have to be from your real life, right? From like paying bills. And I, it's, it's a really odd thing. And I mean, it, it raises the question of whether he's delusional. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't have a great, I've never had a great answer for that. To some degree, I'd have to say yes, but I don't know if he would meet the diagnosis for delusional disorder, but anyway. People are asking about sociopathy too. Is he more of a sociopath? Okay. But let me say this too. Um, Melissa mentioned that it's not atypical for Mormons or those that are LDS to cry during right. testimonies. There's a, yeah. there's might be some condition thing, but then someone else also said, well, crying kind of equates to very intense spirituality, but it still goes back to whether or not you believe it was real or not. I actually think he really was, but I, I don't know. I'm just saying at, as I edited it, I felt that it, the crying was real. We can't see it. We don't know. Yeah. But the fact that still, whether or not it was conditioned or not, he was crying during discussions about his vision and Jason Mao and the warriors. That's what, whether or not it was conditioned or not, that's where he chose to show his emotion. Um, thank you to Robin and to Meredith for two generous donations. Thank you, Meredith. She just sent us a very generous donation. She said, it makes me sick that an average person thinks he can be so important only by making things up in his head. Darn uh, work, he works hard to, darn, I work hard to be a good person. I hate this. Um, it, right, it, right. And ahead, so, some of us work hard to, to be oriented in the real world, right? Like it's, it's, I think that's one of the hardest things to do is to acknowledge our limitations and to function as a human being in the real world, right? Like, and deal with real issues. It's hard enough dealing with real issues. It's, you know, apparently a lot easier to create this fantasy world and go sell it. So, so Samantha Wolf, this was from our Patreon account. I want to read it because um, you already mentioned it briefly, John, but she said, I would like to hear from each of you on the live tonight. Um, your opinion on whether you think Chad Daybell believes his prophecies, et cetera, and if this recording altered that for you. I know that you've shared before that it goes back and forth, but it is so interesting. And I don't remember if you had this recording when you shared that opinion previously. And let me just say this, we did not have that recording when we shared previously. Um, sorry, I just had something else just came up. And I will get that for you. Sorry, hold on. So, um, so I, I think this actually solidifies my perception that um, that he believes it, because the emotion suggests that he's he's all in on his visions, right? Like when I heard him crying in this recording about um, you know these these vision his these unique visions and the way the future is going to play out almost precisely. Um, and him getting emotional about it, you know, it's hard to think that that he's not totally invested in that. Yeah, I, so I'm the one that's been more of a doubter than Chad, or than Chad, you're definitely not Chad, my husband's not Chad. I have been more of a doubter. I go back and forth about whether he believed it or not. After listening to this recording, I, I did change my opinion. As of right now, I am of the belief that he really does believe himself. And I don't know what that means. I mean, that's something else we want to delve into because there's a lot of questions that follow up but to it's, that. And it's not, it's not just that. We've heard from people very close to the Daybell family that he believes. And we've heard from, it's in his autobiography. And um, Melanie Gibb calls his stuff scripture, which we speculated about. Like Chad, so Chad thinks he's writing scripture, meaning he thinks it's, you know, word of God, basically. So, um, I, you know, all of that would, would lead to the conclusion that he thinks this stuff is real. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, someone to that. So Lynn, thank you for your donation. Lynn has uh, donated to us and she asked a question on the previous live with a donation and she wanted to know going to, let's say he believes himself because that is what I'm sensing she wants to know if narcissists have a harder time um determine you know 
deciphering between imagination and reality or, or what, how does that happen? Yeah, I mean, for sure. And the reason is because, um, you know, I, I talk a lot about this idea of mental maps. Um, mental maps, by the way, are, you know, you'll hear psychologists use different terms for this. They'll talk about scripts or schemas or internal working models. Like, unfortunately, our field hasn't done a good job of kind of uh, defining or cognitive networks. Like there's so many ways of talking about it, but um, I kind of like the idea of a mental map because it's, it's more descriptive, right? Like if you think about a map and what that represents, um, I think, you know, our brains kind of operate similarly in terms of our beliefs. So um, for a narcissist on their mental map, uh, you know, their identity and their selfhood is going to be prominent. It's everything gets filtered through that. Okay. So if you think about that for a moment, like if, if your self image is the most important thing to you, um, you're going to distort everything. You're going to see everything through that lens of what, you know, kind of your perceptions, right? Whereas if you can, if you can kind of put that, if you can put your self image aside and I mean, all of us, of course, see the world through our, our own unique lens, but um, some of us, I think, are better at kind of putting that aside. Or, I mean, that's kind of the purpose of science, right? Is to kind of is to is to not let our own perceptions cloud our understanding of things, and we test that. You know, science is about testing hypotheses and not letting our personal views get in the way. So. Um, Narcissists, I think their mental map is so hugely constructed of their own views and beliefs and worldviews um, that it's really, it really distorts their perception of the world. That They see everything kind of through their own lens first and foremost. Okay. And they're evaluating everything through how it affects them, you know, whether it affects them positively or negatively, right? Like you could take something that's, that's neutral. You could take something, um, you know, I, <laughs> um, I don't want to get too political, but uh, you could take something like a virus, right? That, that doesn't really care, doesn't probably care about political views or um, it probably doesn't care what individuals think. Um, but somebody who's a little narcissistic may take something fairly neutral and they might see that in a particular way based on how they see themselves, right? They're gonna, they're gonna kind of use that lens to see the world, um, which will distort it. Right. Um, thank you. I wanna read another Patreon uh, comment, may I? Yeah. This one received a lot of likes from Mary Jo. She writes, he's good at manipulation. He starts out with stuff his audience is culturally prepared to believe. So when he goes off the deep end, they are already nodding and won't notice. At the same time, he skillfully weaves himself in as an integral part of the future he predicts. I am not LDS, so I don't really know at what point his speech went completely off-road. Might be about the same time as God destroys Salt Lake City with volcanoes and earthquakes, but Russia and China are fine. But everyone in that room bought it, including Lori. No way can he say that she was in control of him. He was not framed. He just thought God would protect him. I'm sorry, I listened again and I keep editing this, she says, and then continues. But I just now noticed what you said, Lauren, three days. It was three days after this, after he met Lori, that he was already deciding her kids had to go. OMG. So let me clarify what she's saying. This is allegedly, according to Melanie Gibb, the day that Lori and Chad met face to face. She had been reading his books, but allegedly they met this day. Three days later, on October 30th, Chad Dayball sent Lori Vallow an email telling her that Tylee Ryan was a dark being. And so that's what she means by three days. I mean, do you agree with what she's saying here? 
Like there's no um, way that, well, let me ask you this. Do you agree that there's no way that he can say, that Chad can say, you know, Lori framed me? Yeah, uh, right. Absolutely. I agree with that. You know, I think that it, it's so absurd. If you look at, you know, the thing about the frame framing argument is you have to look at the bigger picture, right? You have to look at who started what. You know, I've always said, if you eliminate Chad's belief system, none of this happens. You know, Charles Vallow was, was labeled as a zombie. They all were in the end. And that's, that's all a function of Chad. Lori wasn't, Lori bought into that, but she wasn't the one doing the labeling, right? So I think um, the manipulation part is a little tricky. I mean, is he manipulating? You know, I don't know. It, it, the question there, I think, is does he believe it again, right? Like if he's manipulating, it kind of implies that he doesn't believe it. But um, I think when he enters that room, he's, pre he's already preaching to the choir. You know, I don't, I don't think he needs to manipulate. I think the people in that room, for the most part, I mean, yeah, there could be a few people that are interested and curious and they don't really understand this group. But um, I think he's already kind of preaching to the choir by the time he, he takes the stage, right? So, um, but is there, a, is there a, you know, a subtle manipulation? Yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, he's, he, the manipulation is that he's getting people to believe this stuff. And the, there's a right. manipulation around the near-death experiences. You know, the, the near-death experiences give him authority, right? Without that, this is meaningless. He, he, has to, he has to sell the fact that his visions are accurate. And the way he sells that is by arguing that the near-death experiences are real and that his veil was torn and he can go look beyond the veil like a deity and he can see the future like a deity. So that gives him authority. Like you really have to believe that first and foremost. So, you know, and that's interesting too, right? Because we know certain people, we've talked to people that are very close to Chad and they've told us that he never talked about that. So he had these experiences fairly early on in his life, um, but he never talked about that, right? So that would kind of imply that he went back and made it up or at least reconstructed the meaning of those events because right. it benefited him. Right. So again, right. that again, that would fit the whole narcissism narrative. Right. Right. Thank you for sharing that. Can I also ask you about. Well, you help me understand what it is. It's almost like a small mindedness. For example, he says that everyone coming from California, their sole purpose is going to be, he said, their purpose in life, that if, if they make it to St. George, Utah, um, during the World War III or whatever, if Californians get there, their purpose in life is to join the church, the LDS church. And then um, someone else, Patrice, wrote us on our Patreon message, our, our Patreon again, and I love that she said, um, you know, she wants to hear about, you know, his savage New Jersey mission. And I, I giggled at that because essentially he also <laughs> implied his mission was this third world country and then he tells us that he served in New Jersey and there's sort of this small-minded like the world revolves around Rexburg where he lives and I don't know how to explain that but it's like he's not and I don't think that's an is that a narcissist thing or is it an IQ thing but he doesn't really seem to grasp the world as a whole and people different than him that think differently. Even his joke about BYU and their University of Utah, the colleges, he's assuming everyone in that room is pro BYU and hates the University of Utah. By the way, they're playing tonight. Go Utes. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, so we, we've talked about this in our podcast. There's, there's this model of personality called the five factor model of personality. And one of the five factors is called openness to experience. It happens to be a really important element of the five factor model, but um, and, and of those five factors, you know, a lot of them are considered like genetic. There's kind of a genetic predisposition to these traits, right? But it gets, it gets reinforced in our families, of course. So um, let's say Chad's low on openness to experience and then he gets in a family that, um, family culture that doesn't really have a lot of curiosity um you know it's just going to get it's going to get reinforced or it's it's going to stay low so um 
you know, and I don't know, I haven't done the testing, but um, I assume that, I assume Chad would score very low on that. Um, openness to experience all, also happens to be highly correlated with creativity. You know, people comment on the fact that Chad is kind of dull and monotone and not the most creative guy. Um, that would make sense, right? If he's low on openness to experience, he's, his creativity is going to be less. Um, it's also correlated with intelligence. I hate to say that, but, you know, I mean, I'm just telling you the research. So um, I have no idea what his IQ is, but people that are, tend to be low on openness to experience tend to be a little lower on IQ scales. Thank you. I noticed during the live when he was, not during the live, excuse me, during this recording. And actually I'm gonna go back because I wanna thank two people for donating and they have a great question, which is relevant to this. Thank you to Shane Murphy and to Melissa Garner for your uh, donations. Shane asked what, who recorded this and where it was and wanted to know if it was Lori and Melanie he heard laughing. So really quickly, the source is to remain anonymous. So we're not sharing that. They requested that. It was recorded on a phone and someone just remembered they had it and they sent it to us and we're very grateful. And one reason we're very, very grateful, there are not a lot of recordings of Chad Daybell. We've heard Lori Daybell a lot more from her testimony at Melanie Gibbs' home She's usually the one talking on these recorded phone calls. So we're very grateful to our source who sent this to us and who trusted us with this really valuable recording. So back. Yeah, oh, I, think it, I think it reinforces a lot of his uh, writing as well, right? Like it's, yeah. it's, important, it's important in the sense that the more we have, you know, we, the more we have of Chad talking and writing and, you know, the more we can understand them. So I think, this really gives us a, a unique glimpse into Chad Daybell. And I, I know some people were <laughs> complaining about how boring it was. And um, <laughs> like, yep. it's, hard, it's hard to disagree with that. But look at it, look at it as research, right? We're trying, to, we're trying to figure out this whole mess. And this is just another piece of the puzzle. Exactly. This is research. And then to also add to it, this was not, this was a preparing a people conference in St. George, Utah. And someone said, oh, I hope it really wasn't that day, October 26th, because that's my birthday. Well, to, to help you out, John and I, at, on this date, were about two miles away. So that's kind of eerie to think about, too. You and I, when Chad and Lori were allegedly meeting at this Preparing a People conference, which is um, a group of LDS people who are visionary and they're preppers, uh, we were about two miles away, weren't we? So my mother's calling, hold on. So anyway, my, um, to that, so that, to that, I just did want to shut, I did want to set the stage a little bit to help people understand this wasn't a church meeting like at, on a Sunday, this wasn't a vow. This was a preparing a people conference where people discuss their visions. Um, and so you're right that he's already with a group of like-minded individuals. I noticed when he was sharing his, uh, conversion to the Book of Mormon. He shared that he was suggested by leaders in the church to read the Book of Mormon, pray about it, and ponder on if it's true or not. And he prayed and prayed, and he said he wasn't getting an answer. And there's this little small moment, and it was brought up by one of our listeners to um, Shelley. And, and he said, well, I realized that things took sacrifice. I was out in the mud reading it. This idea that he had to make it harder or sacrifice and it caught my attention, it's small, but we have talked on our podcast, Hidden the True Crime podcast, about how there was some possible sacrifice involved that he wanted Lori to sacrifice something for him to show her belief. And that's exactly what he did when trying to know if the Book of Mormon is true. Thoughts? <laughs> I mean, am I, I think thinking too? Am I, am I taking it too far? I mean, I just know. I think they're they're a little different. I think he was testing her loyalty, um, but yeah, there could be something to kind of this, um, you know, desire to to test or test oneself or test other people. Um, 
Right, because there's no reason he has to do that. There's no reason he has to, like, you know, go out in the rain and the mud to read his book or whatever whatever he's doing to, to you know, test himself. Right. Uh, Kimberly, thank you for your donation. Um, she asks, would Chad, could Chad be considered a pathological liar? That's a, that's a good question. Um, if, if you think that, if you think that he doesn't believe this stuff, um, then yeah, then it's, then yeah, that would be, then everything he's telling us is, is a lie, right? In the sense that he knows it's a lie. So, um, but if you think he believes it, then, um, then it's a little more complicated. You know, there's definitely some manipulation going on, I think, but if he believes it, it's hard to argue that he's lying. So it's, it's a little tricky, um, that question, I think. Um, and again, there's no set answer to, you know, whether he truly believes it or not. We go back and forth on that all the time, but um, I think if he doesn't believe it, it's a little more sinister right? Like, then the whole idea of Machiavellianism comes in big time that, you know, he's, it's all manipulation to get his way. It's all about power. It's about power no matter what. But, <clears throat> but if he's making the whole thing up and lying to all of us, then the Machiavellian piece is, is enormous, right? Like he's, then he's going to be off the scale on, um, you know, the dark top triad or the D factor. Right. Yeah. Robin B. Uh, thank you. Robin B. is a loyal listener. We are so grateful for her. Thank you for your donation. She asked, um, Dr. John, what's the difference between a sociopath and psychopath? I know we've already talked about a Venn diagram and if any is Chad and I'm going to throw in that many other people are asking, could he be a sociopath? So this is not just a question Robin B. is posing. I think a lot of people kind of yeah. want to know a bit of a difference. Um, so, so academic- No, like no diagnosing. That, <laughs> yeah, we're not diagnosing. Um, people that um, research psychopaths and psychopathy, as it's sometimes called, they don't use the term sociopath. They actually prefer uh, in the literature, like when, when I do evaluations or evaluate inmates, like I'll never use the term sociopath because it's not- considered to be academically credible that um so the, the answer to the question it's a complex question because some people see sociopaths and psychopaths as being exactly the same in other words like the term sociopath has a separate origin but academic researchers they study psychopaths so technically they're pretty much the same thing although some people argue that sociopaths are influenced more by culture and psychopaths are more influenced by genetics. So the history of those terms is a little confusing, but generally speaking, if, if, if you're just talking to someone, uh, you know, in the community and not someone who researches this stuff, um, a sociopath would be more a fun, would be um, like a psychopath, but more influenced by culture and upbringing, whereas a psychopath would be more influenced by genetics. So, but again, from an academic, academic standpoint, like researchers, they, 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 you know, they're always complaining about the fact that people even use the term sociopath because they, they see psychopaths and sociopaths as the same. Okay, thank you. Cindy Berg wants to know, and a lot of people are telling her, great question, great question, ask the good doctors. So does a good doc know think that Chad's grade the digging could have desensitized him to death and murder. Um, I think it played a huge role in what happened for sure. Like that's, yeah, I, that's a really good question because that's always been, you know, we, we did an entire podcast on that and um, there's this, theory called terror management theory. And there's been hundreds of studies now, maybe thousands at this point, um, kind of showing that uh, death anxiety has a really profound influence on human beings. And um, because Chad worked in a graveyard and was around death so much, 
there's no doubt in my mind that um, that his beliefs are probably more extreme and his books are probably a little more extreme because I think they're kind of a response to his fears of death. So I think underlying a lot of this is, um, as Cindy points out, you know, um, this, I don't know if it's a desensitized. I think it's more of an oversensitized, right? Like he's, he's so afraid of death and he's dealing with death anxiety that he has to push it away. And the way he, the way he pushes it away or suppresses it is through his writings and his beliefs and his talks. And like, that's how he's, that's how he's essentially trying to rid himself of any death anxiety. So uh, yeah, I think it plays an enormous role. And I think it's, it's, um, it's a piece in this case that's probably overlooked or neglected to some degree because it is, it is really, I think, a critical, critical piece in this case. Thank you. And somebody mentioned they work at a funeral home. We have a friends that own a mortuary. We're not saying that that means everyone no. that works. No. <laughs> just like it doesn't mean that John analyzes criminals all day that does something. We're just referring to Chad Daybell here and what it could have done to specifically the person that is Chad Daybell. Right, it's, it's yeah. specific to the individual. So, it, you know, we all deal with death anxiety in different ways. Uh, it, you know, people that are, are a little more sensitive to it, like Chad Daybell, are going to probably react more extremely. Yes, thank you. And that episode, and if one of our mods wants to find it, we do a whole thing on death, anxiety, and Chad and his grave digging. It is an entire episode. It's episode 12 of Hidden, a True Crime Podcast. I do believe that one is on YouTube, but you can listen um, on anywhere you get podcasts whether that's Apple or Spotify or wherever. Um, and if you want to hear more of Dr. John, that's our solid podcast. And that is episode 12, where we delve really into that question for about an hour. <laughs> so that's a great question. And there's a lot of answers in that. And it also goes into terrorism a bit. So um, I want to bring up a couple of things that I noticed in the live, or I keep calling it a live, I apologize. The recording of Chad Daybell that I found really interesting, that he does state his books are real very clearly. And he explains, we have, an, we have a recording of Chad saying his books are fiction. That was like in 2007. But uh, in this recording, he states that there was controversy with publishers not liking his books and he marketed them as fiction. I'm paraphrasing, but I'll get the exact quote. He marketed them as fiction, but they're really true. He tells us that very clearly yeah. in the recording. And that is so important because if any of you remember the preliminary hearing, Chad's attorney prior was grilling Melanie Gibb on whether or not Chad's books were true. He was grilling him saying, Chad doesn't believe him because if Chad doesn't believe his books are real, then it's Lori's fault for believing them. I think it's going to be part of the defense. And so here you have Chad saying, my books were marketed fiction. I pretended, but they're really real. They are real. So I just wanted to bring that up and I wanted to hear your thoughts on it. And we're getting some donations. Will you um, talk about that? I'll yeah, I think it's a critical piece. I, I think actually um, the prosecution can use that, you know, um, I don't know if they know this, this recording exists yet, but um Theoretically, yeah, he's he's basically admitting that, uh, and he says in his book too, his autobiography, that uh, he thinks it's all true. So, but again, you know, could he be lying to us all to, to get attention or whatever he's seeking? I mean, maybe, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Thank you to Carrie and Michelle for your donation and Shane for your other donation. I, I like Shane's question. So who has the lower IQ? Chad sets the bar pretty low after hearing that talk. Lori doesn't have to be very smart to fool Chad. Lori, well, and, then, and then he or she says Lori was the leader, but, but which one has the lower IQ? I mean, it's a lot more complicated than IQ, but which one has the lower IQ? Let's start there. <laughs> I, mean, for, I, I, think, I think it might be Chad. But, uh, you know, I, I think from an ethical standpoint, I probably need to stay away from an answer to this question. But um, uh, I think 
I think my my general comment would be um, so we have a we have a a, a Patreon um, subscriber named Erica, and um, anytime we post anything, Erica always writes, and I really I don't know if she's on this, but um, Erica always writes to uh, Lauren and I, and she says, "Where's the critical thinking?" Where's the critical thing? And I, I'm like, yes, absolutely right. Like, where's the critical thinking? Um, there isn't any. So, um, you know, uh, people like Chad and Lori tend to be more um, intuitive and less analytical. They tend to be um, driven more by their emotions rather than facts. They tend to be... Um, you know, less critical thinkers. They, they struggle more to evaluate evidence um, objectively. That the, again, th this is where the narcissism comes back into play, right? Like they, they can't see things objectively because they filter everything through the lens of their own, you know, self images, uh, both of them, by the way. So um, is there a correlation there with IQ? I mean, I don't know. There's probably a correlation with education, but let me just leave it at that. Thank you. Babe, just so you know, over a thousand people are watching right now. And so I want to thank everyone for being here. Share this with your friends as well. It means a lot. And if you could do a thumbs up on this video and subscribe, I think on this video for the first time ever, it said that you had to be a subscriber to chat. Um, and I don't know if that's accurate or not, but please hit the subscribe button either way whether that's real or not and and thank you to everyone for those thumbs up um <laughs> i want to point out too with the whole they're more intuitive and critical thinking there's this infamous video i bring it up all the time i showed a lot of it during the girl on fire interview where eric smith who i've interviewed and julie rowe are in a car on december 26 2018 discussing how they know chad daybell and the media has it wrong and Julie Rowe in that podcast does say, the media has it wrong. I wish so much that people would stop listening to the media and the evidence and, and maybe ask their angels instead and feel what is true. But, you know, we don't live in a world like that. And so I had to bring that up because what you just said reminded me of that, that not only are they not critically thinking, Julie Rowe is, is actually saying, please dismiss facts. Please just listen to your intuition and your angels and, and feel in your gut what's real. Don't, don't pay attention to what you are hearing, <laughs> the facts and the evidence out there. So I, I had to bring that up because you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, can I bring up something that people might not know about? Just some to help people understand, because I think it's really interesting that um, Missouri, can I, can I talk about Missouri for a bit? In the interview, I find it really interesting that Chad discusses Missouri and going to Missouri. In the, in, in the doc dump that happened recently, that's what we call it, the doc dump, uh, we found out that Chad and Lori traveled to Missouri together and Lori looked at flights to Missouri. So everyone's been wondering what's in Missouri, what's with Missouri? We know one of um, a friend was there in Missouri as well, Audrey, but he brings up that the new Jerusalem is going to be in Missouri. Um, so you've got St. George, Utah is a gathering place, Rexburg is a gathering place, but the new Jerusalem and, and it happens in Missouri. And I, and I did want to point that out. He mentioned Adam on Diamond as well. That's also in Missouri, so Independence, Missouri is an important place. I find it interesting they traveled there. I think that again shows that they really did believe this. You know, they're they're flying to Missouri. So just for those that didn't understand that, I wanted to point that out. He also mentioned the Visions of Glory book, which talks about Spencer. That's a book I'm reading right now. It it discusses portals, zombies. Um, it was written by a man named John Pointes or Pointius, who's now deceased. It was published by Cedar Fort Publishing. 
that's Ch that's where Chad was an editor for a few years before the graveyard. And uh, I know that in Lori's phone, Spencer's wife was mentioned. And there's always the question of who's Spencer's wife, who's Spencer's wife. Annie Cushing has done some research, that's Tylee's aunt. And she believes that Spencer's wife, that Spencer was Chad and that Spencer's wife might be Lori, this number in the phone. But I found it really interesting. He brought up Spencer and visions of glory in this recording. And so I want to throw that out there too. Not, not psychological, but I just want to throw those couple facts out there that are really interesting. And then lastly, the gathering in St. George. Uh, someone confirm it for me, but I thought that I had heard that uh, Lori's parents relocated there uh, recently. And I know that Adam Cox relocated to St. George, Utah from Kansas, and he's now a DJ in St. George. So both those things were, I just wanted to throw all those things out there. I edited this for a long time. So I noticed all these little things while finding video for, for it. Um, can I read another Patreon question? Is that okay? Sure. This one is Lynette Butler. Um, and Lynette says, if only the 48 hours crew, and so she's referring to the Daybell Children's interview with 48 hours, the recent one, if only the 48 hours crew had been willing to ask the children, what special role did your father say you would each play in the last days? Let's go around so you can each answer. Do you still believe you will play that role? When did your father tell any of you who you were in a past life? Did God tell your mom herself that she would be dying early? When did your dad tell you? Will the Lord free your father to be a leader in the last days? This would let us know how far their trust in their dad goes. And I think it's important to say, when did, not just did he? Because if he's trustworthy, certainly he would have, right? I think these questions would tell us all a lot about where the kids are now, the Daybell kids, and what they believe. And then I want to bring up, Colette's asked, mentioned it too, and she wants your opinion. He talks about his books just being his children's future, specifically his children's future. And we know that Seth Daybell has voiced some of the books, and um, so has Emma. So... I just threw a lot out there, but I loved that question. Do you feel like we could have learned a lot more about where the kids are if those questions were asked in the 48 hour interview? Oh yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I don't know, <laughs> those, are, those are pretty tough questions. So I don't imagine that they would have answered them honestly or accurately, but um, I think they could have been overwhelmed by any single one of those questions, right? So, um, yeah, um, the questions kind of have the assumption, though, that the, the kids are involved in everything. Um, so, yeah, sure, that would have been really interesting to see how they would have responded. Yeah, I, I think so, too. I think the one thing I think of is uh, them saying, we weren't a part of this cult. If we knew of a cult, if, if we were in a cult, we would have known about it. But I think... I suspect they likely were in the cult and didn't know, or they at least, and, and what I mean by that is they believed their dad and his visions. Right, that's right. It's like the old cliche about does a fish know it's in the water? Here's a question I received privately and Colette asked a similar question, but I'm gonna add on to it. What do you think it means that he brought up, that his books talk about his children's future what did you think of that? In addition, someone wrote me a private message and said, I feel like, I don't know, you know, she was trying to debate whether Chad was a narcissist or antisocial or a psychopath. And she said, well, it seems like he loves his children because if he didn't love them, he would have killed them too. And, and here we hear that they're a big part of the books. Would Chad have killed his children if he was a psychopath or a narcissist? Um, not necessarily. I mean, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a complicated question. Um, uh, you know, I, 
I, th I think he had such an investment in his kids that that probably wasn't going to be an option, whereas he had no investment in the other kids. Right. So, um, you know, I, I mean, <laughs> um, it's, it's such speculation, but I mean, you know, in, in the history of humanity, a lot of human beings have died for ideas and, you know, whatever those ideas are, freedom or certainly religious ideas, right? Defending religious territory or whatever, um, religious beliefs. Um, so I don't, you know, it's it, for many human beings, it's they would rather defend an idea rather than their own kids sometimes. So um, maybe that applies to Lori more than Chad, but um, Chad's kids were grown and um, it seems like if they somehow were in the way of his fantasy or his visions or his idea of the new Jerusalem, then maybe they would have been expendable at that point. But I, I don't think they really, I think he saw the other kids as being more of a deterrent or an obstacle to, you know, his, his vision and his life after, you know, the post-apocalyptic life. And so, I, you know, I, I, the answer is po it's possible that his kids would have been expendable in the right set of circumstances. Cause I, I think for somebody like Chad Daybell, the vision and the idea and, you know, whatever that stuff becomes the most important thing. Um, and again, like a lot of people have sacrificed their kids or maybe not a lot, but some have, have um, chosen, you know, a lot of things, a lot of ideas over, family or kids or whatever. So never underestimate the power of an idea. Well said. And I think that what we did learn from this recording is how much Chad does see his children as part of his vision. He said right. that he envisioned one of his sons doing something very specific. He said his books that are real are about his children's futures. So he was not just invested in his kids in a loving way, but invested in them fulfilling his visions. You know, um, I think that's important to point out. So his children weren't expendable. He didn't write about Tylee and JJ and his visions. He didn't picture the second part of his life that he always talked about. His life has two parts um, and envision JJ and Tylee. So his, his children were a part of that. Right, right. So I, I think if they, if they somehow interfered with that, then there, there would have been problems. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Kate Matheson, for your donation. And we have a great question. Thank you, Karen Michelle, for your donation. Um, I want to ask this too. So she always has great questions, Karen Michelle. She says, Dr. John, what did you notice about Chad's recording that a layperson, all of us, may not notice? And if you didn't know the story before listening, um, oh, so if you didn't know the crime story, you know, the, the murders, would you still have a high level of concern? So those are two separate questions. What did you notice about the recording that a lay person wouldn't? So just share some things. And then B, uh, without your hindsight bias, we both have, we all have hindsight bias listening to this recording. Would you have been concerned listening to this if you did not know what Chad Daybell did? Um, on the first part, I'd say, um, the lack of confidence, you know, the, the, I think there's a real, um, discrepancy between somebody sitting up on stage saying that he's going to save the world. And he has this vision for that. He alone of 7 trillion people has this vision, you know, for the new Jerusalem and the afterlife. Um, and yet he's making comments about his teeth and his weight and the weather. Like, this is someone who comes off as, you know, insecure, right? Like, he kind of lacks confidence. And I, I think a lay person could see that, but it's the discrepancy between what he's selling and what he's saying and the lack of confidence that's interesting that may not be obvious, right? Like, Many people might see the lack of confidence and the insecurity, but 
when you contrast that with the fact that he alone of 7 trillion people is delivering the truth to you, right? And, and yet underneath that, like there's this undercurrent of insecurity or low self-esteem. And you see that in his autobiography, by the way. So it's, it's, it's interesting to me, it was most interesting to me to see it in his talk in addition to his autobiography. And so I think that's a really interesting contrast that stood out to me right away. And people picked up on it. And the, you know, when you did the premiere and the chat, people kept saying he's so boring. And I think they were all kind of saying the same thing. Like he lacks confidence, he lacks charisma, he lacks a lot of things. And yet here he is like pitching us on the end of the world and his vision right. as being the absolute truth, right? So, right. so that's, that's an interesting contrast, I think worth pointing out or something that stood out to me right away. Um, and then the second thing, the second part of that question, would I have any concerns? Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to take this full circle back to where we started with the D factor and the dark factors of personality. Um, I think I'm always going to have concerns. You know, if, if I'm with an inmate and the inmate says, you know, I'm a prophet and let me tell you my visions for the end of the world. And by the way, I know it's exactly what's going to happen to you because I've seen beyond the veil and I know your future. Um, you know, right away, I'm, I'm making a note about narcissism. <laughs> so um, I'm always going to have concerns about someone who thinks they have the truth and they're really self-absorbed and they're, you know, trying to sell that to me or you or whoever that, you know, whenever there's a lot of narcissism, there should be some red flags. Would I, would I necessarily predict that this is someone capable of killing people? I mean, probably not, but um, but I would have to know more, you know, the, again, like I, I, I'd be looking for some of those D factors that I talked about. Um, you know, Chad in his autobiography talks about harming bees and deriving pleasure from it. That's sadism, right? So, uh, you know, it's not something that would jump out to me, but maybe if you dug deep enough, you know, maybe if you kind of uncovered those D factors, narcissism, Machiavellianism, sadism, paranoia, there's some paranoia there for sure. It may not jump off the page, but it, it's there. Maybe some of the, um, some of the traits of, you know, psychopaths, the, the inability to, you know, he can get emotional over his vision, but does he feel sad? Does he ever feel sadness? He certainly doesn't in his books. Right. So I don't know. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I, I don't think it wouldn't be obvious, but there'd be some concerns, I think. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, you wouldn't jump to he's about to bury two children. No. Innocent children in his yard. You would definitely realize that he's not the most healthy person and that you would have concerns about um, his mental health and, and his personality. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and also like, you know, people pointed out he's a little passive, you know, um, we don't typically think of like murderers as being passive. Um, and I mean, they can be, it really depends on the person, but um, you know, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's tricky. I think Chad is definitely somebody that would require um, a lot of testing and a lot of assessment work with to kind of dig deeper and really figure out what's going on and who he really is. Thank you for sharing that. I want to say that Kresha is here tonight, Kresha is JJ's, and it takes a lot to be here as we discuss such a horrible crime. I want to thank all of the people for sharing their really um, interesting insight and thoughts and questions in this case. There was so much that I wanted to get to where um, our babysitter is awaiting a, a ride home. So I'm, we're gonna conclude. I wanna, I, I wanna share that we do have um, Melissa Gardner, one of our listeners, uh, thank you for your donation again. She wrote that she just received her Venus flytrap mug in the mail. I love that. I have mine here. Someone asked in a comment yesterday, our new listeners, what does that mean? It, it definitely is a little inside joke here, but John, um, Barry Cox, 
is uh, called Women Delicate Flowers in a Custody Battle Document. And I thought, I wouldn't want to be called a delicate flower. And John told me, yeah, you're, you would be that, that flower that eats people if you were a delicate flower. <laughs> so uh, I said, you're right. I'm a Venus flytrap. I'm a delicate you're not, Venus You're not a Venus flytrap. You're a delicate Venus flytrap. Right, right. So, but beyond, other people have asked us for uh, things that aren't just Venus flytrap related. And we do have a lot uh, um, more merchandise available on our uh, merchandise store, our logo, Hidden True Crime, and a lot of different things. I did it, and I noticed today that um, I've got to go fix a lot of it. I noticed that I'll, almost everything is titled a tote. Mugs are totes. Shirts are totes. <laughs> Stickers are totes. Look at the picture. That's what we're looking at. <laughs> so I'm going to go fix that, but for anyone looking tonight, um, the photo is what it is, and it'll explain that. But, um, and then for those that haven't listened to our podcast, uh, which is still not done, we have another podcast coming that we're going to do. We won't tell you the name yet, but uh, we're going to put all of the interviews and all of these interesting conversations on there. And then we're going to keep Hidden, a true crime podcast separate. And we're not done with Hidden, a true crime podcast season one. So we'll have some new episodes for you soon. And for those that haven't listened to those episodes, I really recommend going there. That's actually how Hidden True Crime started, right, babe? We did not start out on YouTube. We started out with our podcast. And have we started out, we started out um, with a couple of USB mics and a laptop. And um, at our dinner table one night, we just said, you know, we, we were talking about the podcast for for years actually and um the pandemic uh, you know freed me up or gave us enough time to start it so that's that's when we started it and um it was just kind of on a whim i mean we thought about it for a long time but um but uh it came together because of the pandemic and having more time and at our dinner table so we always like to kind of keep that casual if possible you know keep the kind of that casual conversational tone about um, this being kind of an informal dinner. And um, we, we really do see our listeners as guests. And speaking of that, I think I saw Erica reply to something. I can't see the responses, but um, she may have, when I mentioned her critical thinking <laughs> comments, she, she may have said something about that. So I, I saw her come up quickly, but we read everything people send us. We have to sit down and, and we respond to everyone kind of at different times, but we always read everything. So I apologize if we don't always respond. Babe, one more question, because I think this is full circle from last night. Chelsea Jackman, thank you so much for always being a listener and for your donation. And thank you everyone for your donation tonight. They really help us. Uh, so thank you. But Chelsea Jackman just asked something that Lori kind of, Lori, the good Lori, the good Lori, Lori Hellis asked last night during our TGIF live. She said, well, if Lori continues to believe in her delusions, is there a point at which she is not um, episodic? But what Lori posed last night, well, or you can answer that, but she said, at what point do religious delusions become mental illness too? So maybe those are two separate questions. Answer one of them if, if you need to. But um, if she continues, if, if Lori Daybell continues to believe her delusions, is there a point? Is there a point? A point? Well, at which, so, so is there a point to which, well, let's ask Lori Hellis's question. I'm sorry, Chelsea, but let's ask Lori Hellis's question from last night because it was a question posed at the beginning and end of the podcast. At what point do these extreme religious beliefs, these extreme delusions um, become a mental illness? And we'll leave it at that. You know, the, the, it's really hard to separate out dilute. That's a really tough question because because um, there's no simple answer to it. You know, um, you, you have to factor in cultural fact. You know, there's cultural elements, right? Like if 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 Lori grew up in the Mormon Church, which she did, um, in a family that was very religious. Um, 
you know, you, it would be hard to argue that those were delusions, right? Because that's what she knew and that's what she grew up with. So um, that would be culturally appropriate, you know? So um, if those keep getting more and more extreme and she can't, you know, again, I use this idea of mental maps a lot. If her mental map becomes so distorted and so divorced from reality that she can't distinguish, you know, fact from fiction or she can't do business with the real world, then, then it becomes a problem. Then it becomes a mental health issue. You know, she's not able to function. Um, you know, she can't make sense of simple things. Maybe she can't pay her bills. She can't take care of herself. That certainly becomes a big mental health issue. Um, but you know, in the, I mean, from the stuff we've heard of her, she seems to be able to separate context. You know, she'll, so talk about her extreme beliefs at, at gatherings with similar people right but she doesn't she doesn't do that with the police she doesn't do that in other contexts so um so you have to wonder if if things have gotten you know more extreme over time or have gotten worse right i don't know and since she's been in in jail um right you know but i, I don't it's a really tricky question you know one of my i remember one of my professors saying one time that you know, the way you can know somebody's delusional is that they can't, they don't know any, they don't know what's wrong. They can't distinguish what's right from wrong. Yeah. So, um, but I don't, you know, I think it takes, it takes a fairly detailed assessment to kind of figure that out. And, you know, you'd probably have to spend some time with someone and you'd have to separate culturally appropriate or normative beliefs from, um, delusional beliefs or beliefs that are starting to kind of like take over your mental map so that you really can't function. Um, but there's no, there's no simple answer to that. I don't, I don't believe. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. As Chelsea left her question, many other people started asking kind of that question at what point. So thank you. It's a question, I guess we're trying to answer as we deal with this case and as we process this case and think about this case and, receive and, uh, and uncover more recordings. As Colette said, I loved it. She said, you know, for these people to go against their church and go against, you know, laws, they sure recorded a lot. So yeah. we're very grateful <laughs> that they right. did. So we can That's... try to answer that question that, that, you know, as you pointed out, it's a question to be answered in this case, I think. And we're trying to answer that. And, and we may yeah. figure out more at trial. I'm sure there's a lot of information we don't know you know, and um, yeah, we, we can, we're grateful for the fact that their hubris allowed them to record. They apparently thought that what they were doing was so important that they wanted to record it, which makes sense, right? Like they think that they're the chosen ones that are going to lead the new Jerusalem. So yeah, why not make a record of it? I guess. I, I don't know if that's their logic, but. Right. Thank you. Someone asked where the merchandise is. I put a link to it in the description of this video. And again, um, everything's a tote right now. I'll try to fix that by tomorrow, but look at the picture. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to it, if you go to it, it's just the title. It'll tell you exactly what it is. It's not just a picture. It'll tell you it's the classic tea or the tri-blend tea. I did a lot of them. So I'll just go rename them and not have them be totes. Uh, thank you, Dr. John, for being here. I know that we were gonna get our uh, babysitter home before the University of Utah BYU game. And uh, that was another thing that Chad brought up was when he said that girl was inactive because she went to the University of Utah, he meant she was naughty and didn't go to church. So um, with that in mind, I'll say go Utes tonight and uh, sorry for our BYU fans here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I went to you. I went, I am a University of Utah graduate, so thank is you. The, uh, is the game, is it like, is the game, the BYU-Utah game like going to church? It's called the Holy War. So it's okay, like, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, yeah, kind of just a lot more uh, wild. So anyway, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you for listening to the recording of Chad. Like we said, we think it's really important. We are so grateful for the source that trusted us with this recording and thought to send it. I know there are a lot of people out there that think they don't have anything that's that big of a deal. And then they 
you know, they say, hey, by the way, if you want this, that, you know, that's kind of how this came. I thought, okay, yes, send us the recording of Chad the day he met Lori Ballow, please. And so if you guys have anything or you know anyone that knows something, please send us an email, share it with us. We value uh, so much our sources and what they have allowed us to do in processing this case and seeking answers. So thank you. With that, let's go drive the babysitter home. Thanks everyone for being <laughs> right, here. Thank you. Thank you guys.